I talked with a, a person recently that is in the practice of prostitution this past week, and they they told me all the correspondence they get from the Christian community is, you're going to burn in hell. You're going to burn in hell. That no Christian has ever encouraged them, told them they're praying for them, going to love them, anything like that, that their, their communication is, you're going to burn in hell. Da, da, da. And it made me think of that video when, when I saw that. How are we being perceived in the world? What are we representing um, in the Jesus that we represent? And sometimes, as we said earlier, churchianity, which I think is a, oftentimes a very, very, very poor representation and excuse for real Christianity um, and what Christianity is. Jesus had an open-door policy. He, didn't let, he hated sin. He hated sin so much he died for it. And, um, he, and he took, told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. And then the grace of God appears um, to teach us to deny ungodliness and youthful lust. So I understand the balance of God's mercy and God's grace, but I always want, want to be a true representative of the heart of God. And, and not, um, I think we take sin sometimes and redefine it according to ourselves. This is really bad sin, and this is my sin. <laughs> this is like really bad sin. That person's a really bad sin. Oh, I have white collar sin. It's much more acceptable when when it's when it's really um, all holiness, all unholiness is um, needs to be judged by God and was on the cross. Amen. Revelation chapter twenty two. This is our last in the series called the snapshot of heaven, and we've been. This is probably as extensive as any series I know I have ever done. Um, I'm probably if if and I would, I would end the series today anyway because of the length of it. But we're probably two or three weeks, maybe even four weeks of, of things I could still teach for an hour and a whack. This is a, a large Bible doctrine, much larger than when I anticipated it when I began this series. And you know, I was very candid with you. I began this series as I'm grieving the loss of my daughter, and I'm still grieving the loss of my daughter, so I'm continuing this series. And But this has done, if there's been one point of hope and comfort for me in these last five, five and a half months, has been this study of our eternal home. If you're new to our church, and you know what? Know what I forgot to do? I'll do it after the service. Um, um, if, if you're new to our church, um, please, um, on, the, on the webcast, um, and however you get it, there's, there's a lot more to this message than this what you'll hear today. We talked about going home, the whole mentality of, of understanding home. Then we went into the present heaven, the immediate place where Christians that die, they go into the, what we know as the present or the intermediate heaven. Then we talked about the judgment seat of believers, which is an imperative doctrine for us to grasp and what that would mean for us in eternity. Then we spent a few weeks back on the Millennial Kingdom, and how the Millennial Kingdom is a, is a precursor to the Eternal Kingdom, and there will be an incredible amount of um, similarities between the Millennial Kingdom and the Eternal Kingdom, which we've been talking, this is our third week, on the Eternal Kingdom. We talked about that, and then three weeks ago we started on the Eternal Kingdom, uh, the New Jerusalem, which I'll read these verses in a moment. We, we titled the series, The Snapshot of Heaven. I give you a picture of something. You can look at the picture, but it's one dimensional, isn't it? It's not it's just the picture. I can give you a picture of me, but until you met me and conversed with me, you wouldn't know me. You just have a snapshot of me. You could describe me to a certain point. You could say things like, "Well, that man looks very good with no hair," and th and things like that. Things that you would obviously say probably. I forget you. <laughs> and uh, and so so there is um. But, but it would still just be a snapshot. It's a one-dimensional image or description, like a picture on the wall. Because we're bound by our limited understanding, our human vocabulary, and vocabulary is important, to fully apprehend what God has prepared for us in our, in our future home. Most of us have all said goodbye to the people that we love. Parents, grandparents, children. If you haven't, you will. And it's called life. It's a full letter word. Um, sometimes we say goodbye to people way before we'd ever expect to. Some of these voids and these holes in our heart cause us to have some sort of a, I call a limp. I'll be limping the rest of my life. 
to some degree. I pray by making heaven as real as possible as we've tried to do. We try to make it as attainable as we could possibly make it these past few weeks. Some of you have found some sort of comfort, some sort of hope, because this world has a tendency to take it. You will endure loss someday. Please keep this before us. We started this ser this series back on the week before Easter with the Colossians th 3. Set your affections on things above. We'll end it there today. Let's start reading. Revelation chapter 21. Then the angel showed me a river <clears throat> with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of Main Street on each side as the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. I think what's being said here, this is the eternal state inside the New Jerusalem. So the, the, the river grew a tree of life. Many fields we brought out last week, plural, trees of life, be numerous trees, open for debate, bearing 12 crops of fruit. So the, the, the tree of life has 12 crops with a, with a fresh crop each month, representing time. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations, representing other nations. I didn't say that. The Revelation 22, verse 2 said that. No longer there will be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him. And they will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there in the new city. No need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. And the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. I put that in bold, what will happen soon. Now this was written 2,000 years ago. And he said this is going to happen soon. When I read that, I asked God, God, could you define the word soon to me? Because in my English, this should have already happened. And, uh, but somehow soon in, heaven, in the heavenly um, timetable apparently is a little bit longer than my soon. <laughs> but who thinks it's sort of coming soon? The world's a pretty stable place right now, I think you'd all agree. <laughs> Not a whole bunch going on. I don't even watch the news anymore without medication. <laughs> It just depresses me. <clears throat> Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. I, John, the one who heard and saw all these things, and when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant of God just like you. And your brothers and the prophets, as well as, as well as all who obey what is written in this book, worship only God. Look, I'm coming soon, says it again, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat from the tree of life. Skipping down to verse 17, and the, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let everyone who hears this say, come. Let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. Verse 20, he who is faithful witness to all, to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be God's holy people. Now, this is returning, referring to the return of Christ, obviously, but he is coming soon, isn't he? He's either coming soon in the clouds or he's coming soon to take us home through death. But he's coming soon. My 75-year stint, if I'm given that many on earth, is soon in light of everything. I've just turned a young 54. Very, very, very young 54. The last 53 years have gone remarkably quick. Um, he's coming soon. 
I never thought about retirement. Now I think about it. I never think, not thought about my, the mortality of my human body, but now I think about it. I never thought about it in my youth because he's coming soon, and every year that passes by, I understand a little bit more what soon is. If you're young, strap your seatbelt in because it's going to go quickly. So let's go back to next last week and, and talk about some of the practical things about life in heaven. What will be the question is what will we do in heaven? We started addressing this last week. <clears throat> Again, I'm leaving many things out, <clears throat> and and I'll post these on Facebook so you can go back and look at these notes and look up the verses if you don't catch all the verses. I'm not going to give them all to you because it's just too many, and I want to take all that time to do it. <clears throat> What will we do in heaven? First thing we'll do, we'll, we, we will reign and administrate with Christ. How does that work? Well, we, we see that nations come to the new city. We saw, read earlier last week that kings. So it points to a government and a world that's functioning sort of like we're, we're functioning now with the new Jerusalem being the, the, the hub, the pinnacle, the capital of planet earth. But with still other governmental rulers and governmental and, and national designations. Like Pascali, I what does I don't know. I don't know how that really plays out. I'm just taking the word of God for what the word of God says. It says nations in the eternal kingdom will come before there. Before the before in the New Jerusalem, into the gates. Let's read first Corinthians chapter six, verse two and three. Talking about judging other believers and lawsuits, but look what the apostle says. Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide these even even matters amongst yourself? Let me stop there for a moment. But so he says we're going to judge the world. Now, is that talking about the millennial kingdom? Yes, it is. Have we shown you a, a, a month ago, I guess, that the millennial kingdom and the eternal kingdom are going to have remarkable similarities? Some differences. Yeah, it does. They're going to. Will the millennial kingdom bleed into the eternal kingdom? Will many things that are renewed on the planet Earth follow us right into the eternal kingdom with God? Yes, very likely. Most believe that. In fact, very few don't. Don't you realize that we'll judge angels? I don't know the angels rule um, in the millennial kingdom. I'm not sure what they do. The scriptures are sort of quiet on that. But I know what they do in the eternal kingdom. Don't you realize that we'll judge angels? So you should surely be able to res resolve ordinary disputes in this life. So the fullness of this promise is often, and it's repeated throughout the scriptures, is that we will reign and administrate with Christ. And that's really part of the judgment believers, the Bema Seat Judgment of Believers, where we're given certain rules of authority and tasks to perform and places to reign over on planet Earth and potentially throughout the universe. Please understand, I'm not an original thinker. The people that I read and study with are pretty conservative, sort of boring. But their scholarship is sound. So I read an enormous amount of different commentaries and, and books and refer to these things, and I sort of take, make sure they have a scriptural backing for it, and I take majority rules on many of these things, but I, I, I'm very careful not to take literary license, and if I do, I tell you about it. So we have positions of authority that will differ in, in, eternal, in the eternal kingdom. We reign and administrate with Christ. Now, think about this. And second thing, we, might, we may, we may rebuild cities. I got this thought from Paul Enns. Paul Enns wrote a systematic theology from Moody Handbook of Theology. He was trained at Dallas Theological Seminary. He teaches now at Idlewild Baptist Church. He lost his wife for 46 years in the last two or three years ago and wrote an incredible um, doctrinal theological work on, on heaven. One of, my, I, one of the key resources I used for the series, him and a few others. And this was, this was things I, I gleaned from his writing. We may rebuild cities. Isaiah 61, verse 4. Amos 9, 14. We may build homes. Contractors are excited about this. But you can't charge. <laughs> so, so don't get too excited. <laughs> Isaiah 32, verse 18. Isaiah 65, verse 21. Some will compose and write music. That will probably be me. 
Because <laughs> I'm so gifted in that. <laughs> I'm going to be healed when I get up there. I'll actually have a key. <laughs> God, I was born without a key. It's a birth effect. So I'll actually have a key when I get up there. Revelation 4, 14, verse 13 says this, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, and their good deeds will follow them. The word follow there is meta, and it means in close association with. So the believer's good deeds or good works follow us into heaven. Could it be that the certain gifts that we have and have been gifted with on planet Earth will follow us in heaven if it's applicable? Could teachers on earth be teachers in heaven? Potentially. Because as we said last week, our distinctiveness doesn't, we don't leave our distinctiveness behind. You are you. God made you a certain way. You have DNA that makes you an individual. God gave you that DNA. You were created in His image and you and sin came in and corrupted that DNA. So there's certain things that need to be healed. We'll show that a little bit later. But you are, you, are an, you are an individual created to bring glory to God and to fellowship with God. We're not going to heaven as robots. We're not a bunch of lemmings that all think and we're, all, we're going to be individuals just like you are now. We may look different. Some of you are saying, yes. And we'll definitely think different. There are musical instruments in heaven. You're singing in heaven. Revelation 5, 8, 5, 9, 14, 2, 15, 2. We serve God. The scriptures say we'll serve Him in heaven. How do we serve Him? Well, I've sort of already said that, I think. We serve Him through reigning with Him. We serve Him through praising Him and praise. We serve Him from a, a, a faithfully performing whatever is laid on our before us as we enter the eternal state. Just like we serve Him now. Can some farm in heaven? It's going to be farming in heaven? I don't know. Read Isaiah 30, verse 20 and 23. Isaiah 55, verse 13. Isaiah 65, verse 21 and more. You can read them online. You say, well, that's referring to the millennial kingdom. Are you sure? No, you're not. No, I studied it. You're not sure. It could be. might be. Livestock. Isaiah 30, verse 23. One commentator who likes to fish says there's fishing in heaven. Some of you are like, whoa, Hank's like, yeah. He, he has, fishing's already heaven for him. Ezekiel 47, verse 10. Because many of these things will be a, a continual, again, a continual lifestyle that we take from, from the millennial kingdom into the eternal kingdom. If there's, and there's a lot of that depends on the continuation between the two. So this heaven is going to be in somewhat very remarkably different, but in some, some of these pleasant, wonderful things that we love about planet Earth could very likely follow us there, but be redeemed and without the curse of sin and death on any of it. Now, I told the story of the first service. I had a, when writing that letter this week, the long letter, as you see, is a page and a half long, and I had numerous versions of it because on Friday they threw the curveball about the property to me. So I had to rewrite the letter and add a bunch of stuff. And I had all these different letters going on my, my computer. And, and I, I had to clean this up before I get confused and delete the wrong one. So I delete, 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 delete. And I deleted my notes for Sunday morning. They were all, not totally done, but about 90% done. My whole message I had prepared. And you know how good my mind is about remembering things. And so I'm looking, oh, I was whining and complaining for quite a while about it. But, uh, but, I, but I, I, um, in restudying this, the message, I had just had another thought came to me. And I said, boy, if, if this is the only thought that um, I would have left out the first message, it was worth restudying it. Because there will be a new you we know on the outside. We know we have resurrected bodies. But I want you to understand there will be a new you on the inside also. Think of that. We think about our physical stuff quite often, but think about the moment we breathe eternal air, those subtle needs that have followed you all your life, inside needs, will be met. Think about those fears 
that, that sometimes are subtle, sometimes you, you know they're there, sometimes you don't even know they're there. And the, in a moment's time, those fears will be vanquished. If, if you're one of those people that love to be affirmed, and we all do to a point, you'll have a heart full of affirmation from Jesus Christ. If you're attracted to the, the world system's goods, you need stuff, you need whatever, that security, the need for security will all be met in a moment. That substance that you abused and went on to abuse you right back, whatever that is, that grip in your life will be gone in a second. Secret places of shame. These areas of your life that no one knows about, and sometimes we don't even know about them. We walk with them through time and space with some sort of a psychological, emotional limp, not even realizing that we're encompassed with and encumbered by these deep-rooted needs and hurts and pains in our life whether they be insecurities or fears, self-consciousness, poor self-esteem, it's all gone. In a moment of time, we're going to look and see, wow, wow I, I have this new body. But I have a funny feeling we're not going to be cons as consumed with the new body as we will be the new us on the inside. We're going to be healed of things we don't even know that we have need of healing. We're going to be man and women as man and women were intended to be. Fully affirmed, fully secure, with no fear, with no past that haunts us. No seeking man's approval, not because we don't need man's approval. We're simply going to look at relationships to love and give and not receive anything from because we don't need anything from those relationships. We'll have answers that we've always sought, but never could find. Lost dreams will either look foolish or they'll be fulfilled. We'll realize how empty those dreams were, or God's going to make them real. You're going to be not only resurrected on the outside but you'll be resurrected on the inside think of this you're going to think about yourself like Jesus thinks about you won't that be something you won't have any frame of reference to the past any longer in the sense of it's not going to control your life any gripping fears or insecurities Anger issues will be gone. And on the inside, you're going to be redeemed. We talk about the physical things of heaven quite much, but this might be the thing outside of Jesus that captures us more than all the rest. Some of us know ourselves pretty well, and we know why we tick and have certain fears and insecurities and have tendencies to do certain things. Some of us never think deep enough to even understand those ourselves, so we go through life whatever, without ever really dealing with issues we maybe could deal with. All that, what I just said, won't be that relevant, because in a moment's time, I'll be in the presence of God, and I'll be absolutely whole. Not just physically whole and free from pain and the effects of sin on my physical body, but I'll be whole psychologically. I'll be whole emotionally. I'll be whole physiologically. I'll be whole in every way. I can probably fathom living a pain-free physical existence more than I can fathom not having any depravity in my soul. That will be one of the greatest mysteries and blessings when we first get to heaven. Next thing I want to bring up is called the beatific, beatific vision. Some of you have heard that term before. It's an old Latin term, which means happy making sight. The ancient theologians were commenting on Revelation 22:4, where they says that where it says we will see his face. 
Now, this was a shocking idea, obviously, to the Jews as well as the Gentiles in the times the Scriptures were written. The high priests back then, the high priests could enter the Holy of Holies just once a year. Because the Shekinah glory of God was above the mercy seat, Exodus 25, um, 45, 22. The mercy of God was above the mercy seat. And once a year, he had to make sacrifices for his family and, and do all the exact ritual things just to come in to see the presence of God, which was a cloud. Once a year. If he didn't do it right, he would be struck dead. And they had a rope around his leg to pull him out. I'm sure he did it right. The presence of God was a fearsome thing. When Uzzah, the priest, touched the ark and moving it with David, he just fell dead. They knew that story. When Moses said, show me the glory, God looked at Moses and said, I can't show you my glory, you'll die. No man can see God and live. So when I get to the mountain, I'll just stick your face in a rock. <laughs> and Moses had a permanently dye job in his hair, a Shekinah glory dye job. He went from... I don't know what he was, but his hair became remarkably radiant by the glory of God after that. Let me read you 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. He alone, talking about God, can never die. And he lives in a light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. <clears throat> Amen. We can't see God because we're not holy. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Look that verse up when you have time. Ho only holiness can come into the presence of God. We need to be made holy. And of course, we were through the cross in our positional standing with Christ. We were made holy through His death on the cross. This is the greatest wonder of redemption when we're welcomed into the presence of God Himself to have a face-to-face -face relationship with Him. Think of that. to whom we pray to by faith now, to whom we, we think of and we imagine and we get on our knees and we meditate and we think about Jesus. In just a fraction of time, we have a face-to-face -face relationship with him. What will he look like? All I have to do is get a few paintings. I'm not sure what he's going to look like. But the Christ we worship in heaven will be worshipped as God, but also as man. I want you to think with me for a moment. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The incarnation of Christ when Jesus came to earth on Christmas changed heaven as well as earth forever. It changed the face of the Trinity Forever. You might not have thought about this, but think with this with me. God didn't put on a human body as if it was a coat. He didn't contain two separable components, man and God. This is the God half, the man half. To be switched on and off as well. Rather, he is and always will be man and God. This is a mystery. We call this in theological circles the hypostatic union. Ask me to explain it, I cannot. It's a mystery. But he was the only and will be the only God-man. But when Jesus came to earth, he was given a human body. And when he resurrected, a human body was resurrected. And he'll inhabit heaven with a human body, like we will too, a resurrected human body. Will it be different from ours? I would guess it would be. Remarkably different from ours? I would think if that probably is true too, but even though I have no scriptural Teaching on that, I don't see that. Let me quote, let me quote Randy Alcorn. He said this, When Christ died, he might have appeared to shed his humanity, but when he rose in an indestructible body, he declared his permanent identity as, as the God-man. J.I. Packer writes this, But by the, by the incarnation, by the incarnation, the Son became more than he was before. Amazing statement. And the human element became an integral part in the ongoing life of the triune God. Christ's glorified humanity, which is the template and the link for the glorification that is ours, and must go on forever. This is a mystery so great 
it should leave us breathless. So what will Jesus be like? Well, I haven't seen him. I know I'll be able to embrace him. I'll be able to talk with him and walk with him and converse with him. In the mysteries I don't understand, I'll have access to him, even though there'll be billions and billions of people there, but somehow he'll find time for me and I'll have access to him, and I don't think I'll have to wait in line. Again, I don't understand the mystery of that, neither do any of us in our finite understanding. But that's what's going to make heaven so heavenly. <laughs> Created in every man and woman is a yearning to know God. It is our deepest desire, though many on planet Earth never embrace it. In the counseling office, which we have done much through the years, it's, um, you'll find that there's always, in counseling, you're always usually finding something horizontally that people are misaligned in their life, whether it be a marriage or something that happened in their past. Something on a horizontal level is, is not working right. The pistons aren't firing right. It's just causing them grief or heartache or pain in their life. Maybe something from their past, depending on what the situation is. But it's a funny thing because in my, my approach to all these things is, is I can, we can maybe make the horizontal life a little bit more palatable. We can put certain things in play depending on what the situation is to make it more tenable. But ultimately, man was created to know God and to worship Him and glorify Him and we were created for His pleasure. So ultimately, I need to always go back to my original point. What was I created for? You were created to know God. You were created to fellowship with God. You were created to get your needs met from Christ. And inside every man and every woman is that desire to know Him. That's why so many approach Him. Though, again, many of us never embrace it. Augustine said this, he called God the end of our desires. He prayed, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Heaven as we've seen it is marvelous. It's beyond our understanding. We've been blessed with a scriptural snapshot of it. And I'll confess to you, when I think about heaven, especially the last five months, I just think about seeing my daughter. That's my first stopping point. That's the first person I want to find when I get there. Say, Pastor, that ain't spiritual. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, um, I don't care if it's spiritual. That's where I'm at. And, and I'll probably be that way to the second that I go there. It can be changed pretty quickly at that point. I don't want to sound super spiritual, and, and, and some say, I don't worship the gifts, I worship the giver. That's a nice bumper sticker, but it, what you've done, the mistake you've made, is you've separated the giver and the gifts. The gifts of God proceed from the heart of God, the character of God, the nature of God. Don't separate the giver from the gifts. They're both wonderful, and they're both worthy of, of not the gifts, but to praise Him and thank Him for the gifts that He's given us. Heaven will be the unspoken, unbroken presence of God. We will cease to see things through self-based self vision and see Jesus for all He is. We'll see Jesus in all of His beauty. We'll see Jesus in all of His majesty. We'll see Jesus in all of His glory. I'll see my parents... Mom and dad, I'll see them as they wait for me. I'll see for my, my children that have gone on before me or my grandparents. I'll even get a chance to meet my ancestors and, and people who have, who are my, my, my ancestors who I've never met. I'll even get a chance to meet them. But when I hit heavenly air and the heavenly atmosphere, I think everything's going to change and flip inside of me. Because in a moment's time, as we said earlier, I will understand the great need I had for redemption and the great grace that was bestowed towards me in redemption. And I'll immediately be looking for the person who, who died for me and shed his blood for me and made this new home of mine possible and potential for me to even be there. 
No longer will I see different shades of unrighteousness. I'll know how lost I was. I'll know how bad my sin was, how dark my life was. I'll know how, how much I had fallen short of the glory of God. And I'll also see the magnitude and the majesty and the magnificence of grace reaching down and picking me up and giving me a, a identity I could never have and giving me a salvation I could never earn. I'll see that all in one millimeter of a twinkling of an eye. And I'll embrace those who I, I know, whom I love, and my heart will rejoice in the reunion, but nothing's going to cause me to rejoice more than seeing Jesus. That will capture me. That vision, His face, His commendation, His love, which I believe now by faith because He, has, he, gives, he gives us the Word of God will be mine. Mine for real. Let me read you a book, the book of Job. In Job 19, verses 25 to 27. This is interesting because the book of Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. He says, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Right in the midst of his trial. He lost everything. And he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I shall see God. See, Job understood something ancient as this book was. He understood that his body was going to go into a grave, it would decay, but in my body I'll see God. He understood the resurrection. He understood I'm going to be resurrected, and my body will see God. And I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. Look where he says this. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Job had much loss. Ten children. Security, all of the above. He didn't talk about any of that, even though I'm sure his heart was as broken as any parent's. I will see him, Jesus, with my own eyes. I'm overwhelmed, not with the reunion, but I'm overwhelmed with the thought of seeing Jesus with my own eyes. So I'll end where we began months ago. Colossians 3, 1 to 2. If you be risen with Christ, first class conditional clause, and you are, if you be risen with Christ, and you are, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections, phroneo, your mental attentions, your focus, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. It's a great verse. The apostle talking to the church at Colossae. In Hebrews 11, the patriarchs said they desired a better country. They sought a better country to come. The word desire there simply means that there was a deep yearning in their heart. There's something they were always reaching for. They walked on planet Earth. They had homes. They had families. They had children. They had cities. They had governmental rules. They had occupations and jobs. and They, did, they had everything that life gives us. But in their heart of hearts, deep down inside of them, they understood they were created for something bigger than that. They were created for something more eternal than that. They sought it. They knew it was coming. They didn't know when it was coming, but they knew somewhere on the, on the, on the, down the future, there's going to be this new home for them, this better country, this new city. And this yearning molded their lives. It occupied their subtle thoughts. It influenced their decisions. It imparted them hope when the world took theirs. And I'll leave you with the same thing. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Don't become too attached to the things here in time and space. Don't put your self-esteem into how other people react or respond to you. Don't make human relationships replace a divine relationship with God. Keep this understanding. Take this little rock inside of your, your pocket, this little piece of heaven we bought on Amazon. It's amazing. I don't know how they got the contract. But, um, but this, this little piece of heaven, hang on to this little piece of heaven. This is, where, this is what represents where I'm going. This is where my, my life was meant to be. It wasn't meant to be here. I wasn't created for this. This is not the all of all. That is yet to come. I'm just preparing for that right now. 
So I look to heaven, I, I think about it, I dream about it, I talk about it, I thank God for it. I meditate on it. I have big decisions to make. What would be an eternal decision? What was the best decision to make eternally? I look at human relationships. And I, am, I, am I expecting too much from this human relationship and not enough of my vertical divine relationship? I become, in a sense, heavenly minded. I set, not in the sense of my common sense, but I set my affection on things above. It's okay to have things here. God gives them. They're all gifts. It's okay. But my affections aren't here. My affections on things above. I want to live now to stand before God with the things above. Dear Jesus, thank you for the...